All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ella. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne. And if you can't tell by these photos, I am easily distracted by all the amazing plants we have here in um, Victoria. Uh, I'm really excited to be here on Wurundjeri Country, a place uh, with a long history of applied fire. And that applied fire has shaped life on Earth. This figure here is showing us um, the amount of area that's burnt annually. And as you can tell, it's a lot. It's actually 4 million kilometres squared. Um, so this, uh, this amount that fire burns has a massive impact on uh, lots of global processes, including biodiversity. And we can think about fire as a pattern of fire. So not only the timing of fires, but also the characteristics of fire themselves, such as um, how severe they are, or um, what I mean by that is the severity, the impact of the intensity of the fire on the vegetation. And one of the places in which fire has impacted biodiversity is in beautiful Gary Wood. And this uh, figure here is showing my 56 sites from my PhD, as well as um, the amazing diversity in patterns of fire in Gary Wood. So it's showing one to nine fires since 1939. And because of this amazing diversity of plant uh, of fire, sorry, plants have uh, fire-related traits that help them thrive in fire-prone ecosystems. So things like fire-stimulated flowering on the left, uh, post-fire resprouting, and also the storage of seeds in canopy cones. But fire patterns are changing, and this is threatening biodiversity. So we've all seen the news in Hawaii and Greece and in Australia. Um, these changing patterns of fire are impacting biodiversity in a bad way. So what we need to do, what we need to know is um, what kinds of fire, as in the timing of fire and also what um, kinds of fire are going to support plant populations into the future. And also we need to be able to generalise these patterns to species across ecosystems and environments. So one way that we might be able to do this is by using those really awesome um, plant traits that I was talking to you about before. So for example, if a plant re-sprouts like these two species on the left, or if it takes a long time for a plant to mature like the oyster bay pine, or if they store their seeds in the canopy like all of these species, this might um, help understand, um, sorry, this might <laughs> um, contribute to the way that they can tolerate fire and which types of fire they can tolerate as well. So I wanted to figure this out. So I wanted to understand what patterns of fire support Victorian plants. And I had four questions to help me do this. So the first one was, how does the timing and type of fire influence mature plants? The second one was, does the timing of fires influence seeds in the canopy? Does the timing of fires influence seeds in the soil? And lastly, can we predict the influence of fire on species based on those traits that I was just talking about? So, uh, the way that I, the reason I wanted to do these four questions was to understand how fire influence plants across their life cycle. So these four questions are getting at different stages of the plant life cycle and also different types of plants. So as we know, Australia has beautiful heath, <laughs> and the heathly woodlands of Gary Woods are no exception to that. So Gary Wood is a great place to study plants, and my funders also thought the same thing. So I went out to Gary Wood and I surveyed plants, counted the canopy cones and sampled the soil. So that's actually sampling the seeds inside the soil as well. Oops, my video, I forgot to press my video. And then I also conducted uh, laboratory and germination experiments. And yes, that is a Banksia kebab. I wouldn't recommend biting into it though. Um, I observed, oh uh, sorry, go back. And then from those, after those laboratory experiments, I grew about 39,000 seedlings um, in a greenhouse trial, and that, they came up naturally from the soil seed bank. And we had amazing plants germinating from those soil seed banks, including, um, oops, I've lost a slide. Oh, well, <laughs> hopefully uh, all the slides are in there. Okay, I've lost a slide somewhere, but uh, imagine that there's a beautiful slide there about rare plants as well. That So I observed rare plants that weren't um, in the above ground vegetation too. And then with that data, I built statistical models. So uh, the, the beauty of um, this data is we can actually use statistical models to understand patterns. So um, here we have um, on the x-axis time since fire and on the y-axis relative abundance. And the dot, the dot points are observed data. 
And we used a regression modeling that helps us to understand nonlinear patterns. So by um, fitting these models, we can see the highest and lowest points in relative abundance. And this was really cool, and we can use it to understand kind of responses to fire. And I did this for lots of different species. So how does the timing and typing, how does the timing and type of fire influence plants? So uh, to figure this out, I used proportion of mature plants at a site as the response variable. So that's on the y-axis, the vertical axis. And on the x-axis, we have time since fire from zero to 15 years. So what I want you to take from this is that plants need time to mature to grow a seed bank. So if you have a look at the first couple of years post fire, a lot of the, um, sorry, a lot of the plants are not mature. But when you get to 10 years post fire, about 50% of them are mature. And this is really important because it tells us whether there's an available seed bank um, there for them to recruit after the next fire. And this was the same for both high severity and low severity fires. And does the second question, does the timing of fires influence seeds in the canopy? So as I shown with that first, um, first result, the um, canopy stored seeds need time to grow. But we found that once canopy seeds start growing, for some species, they then um, quickly decline as time since fire increases. So between uh, too long between fires can actually reduce the available seed bank. Now this is a fairly weak relationship, but what I want you to see is that the number of cones per plant, which is on the y-axis there, um, is uh, reducing as time since fire increases. And after 40 years, we actually don't observe any cones um, on, on these plants. So third question, what about in the soil seed bank? We found that uh, fire, frequent fire can also deplete the seed bank for some species. So this graph here is showing the ones is when we've observed a, a plant at a site and the zeros is when we didn't observe that at the site. So what this model is doing is, uh, I guess, showing you the probability of occurrence from one to zero across the number of fires since 1939. So what I really want you to focus on is this uh, space here. And as you can see, where there's a higher fire frequency, we don't actually observe these species in the seed bank. So this was the same for different kinds of species that share the same characteristics. So the more fire there is, the less of these species we can see. But this wasn't the case for other species with different kinds of traits. So this is the same kind of um, response, sorry, same kind of predictive variable, number of fires since 1939. But as you can see, they're having kind of divergent responses. So some are peaking in the middle and some are um, peaking as they go on. And this is dependent on those traits that I mentioned earlier. So that brings me to uh, the next question. Can we predict the influence of fire based on these traits? So we found that yes, it is possible to predict how species respond to fire. So these two figures are hypothesized or a priori predictions for how species might respond to time since fire. So how their abundance changes or their um, presence in the landscape. And the, the way that we developed these predictions was by using the characteristics such as their, um, if they re-sprout or not, or how long it takes for them to mature. And we said, okay, some of them are gonna respond like this, some of them are gonna respond something in a different way. And we had a bunch of different predictions like this. But when we modeled the um, actual species responses, we found that we could make fairly good um, predictions for how uh, plants will respond to fire. Um, and this was the case for 75% of species. And this is really cool because with this information, we can um, predict where species will be in the landscape based on fire and make generalizations based on the characteristics of traits that allows us to apply that to different species and different environments. Thank you. So what can we conclude from this? Well, fire shapes plants across their life cycles. So how plants grow, when they mature and how many seeds they produce. And this is dependent on the traits that they exhibit. And because of those traits, because that it's dependent on the traits that they exhibit, a mix of fire is gonna support different kinds of species. So what I mean by that is having a landscape with different um, frequencies of fires and different types of fires. And we like to call this pyrodiversity. That said, fire shouldn't be too short because for some species, fire frequencies more than every 18 years will be um, a problem for them. 
but conversely, too long without fires, more than 40 years, is going to be damaging for others. So by quantifying the types of fire regimes that support, the, sorry, the, <laughs> quantifying the different patterns of fire that support different types of plants, this is going to help us understand how to prevent extinction in these ecosystems. And this helps scientists, managers and local Victorians take action to protect biodiversity. And I had the pleasure of working with a local organisation that is protecting um, biodiversity now, Nature Glenelg Trust, by giving them the seedlings that we grow, grew from the soil seed bank trial, they could actually restore the landscape um, adjacent to Gary Wood. So that was really exciting. So understanding the types of fire that prevent extinction is also essential as fires become more severe and more frequent in the future. Thanks so much to all the volunteers that came out and helped me, my amazing supervisors, people that I've collaborated with, and also the funders who, which after that, <laughs> I'm tripping on my words, but uh, without whom this would be um, not possible. So thanks very much.